lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. When we read this passage, we read that it happened shortly after Elijah had given up the ghost, after, after he died. Elisha died in verse 20, and they buried him. Now, the bands of Moabites would invade the land in the spring of the year, and they were burying a man. Behold, they saw a marauding band, and they cast the man into the grave of Elijah, Elisha. And when the man touched or made contact with the bones of Elisha, he re revived and stood on his feet. Now Haziel, king of Aram, had oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz. But the Lord was gracious to them and had compassion on them and turned to them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and would not destroy them or cast them from his presence until now. When Hazael, the king of Aram, died, Ben-Hadad, his son, became king in his place. Then Jehoaz, the son of uh, Jehoahaz took him from the land of Ben-Hadad, the son of Haziel, and the cities which he had taken in war from the hand of Jehoaz, his father. Three times Joash defeated him and recovered the cities of Israel. This was shortly following the death of Elisha. It was not long afterwards. We don't know how long, but obviously he had not been long deceased. Now, we do know that in the times of Jesus, it was believed that the Shekinah hovered over the death of a righteous man for up to four days. For the first three days, on the fourth day, it would, it would depart, or he would depart. That is the significance of, of Lazarus' resurrection, for instance, um, where it said he'd, he'd been dead four days. It meant that he was completely defunct, and there was no more spiritual life even associated with his corpse. Well... That was the background the Jewish thought at that particular time. It was a resurrection miracle. Now, the Old Testament is always a type of Christ. It was always a type of Christ, everything that happened. When you see a resurrection narrative or, or miraculous narrative involving resurrection in the Old Testament, it is a picture of the type of Jesus. What it means is, through his death and resurrection, we have life. Through the death and resurrection of Jesus, that we have life. It's, a, it's an Old Testament type. Now, no place, no place was such fetishism as relative, as relics ever practiced anywhere in the early church or in Judaism. Neither was grave soaking. The idea of laying on a grave and trying to get the anointing from a dead person is ridiculous. This is a one-time miracle that God allowed as a sign that prefigured the death of Christ and resurrection of Christ and so forth and the, and the eternal life that believers will have through Jesus' death. We will come out alive. But it was again at that time a sign that despite the sin of the people, God would not give them over to their enemies. He would allow them to go through the consequences of their action but he would bring them back to life. And <coughs> it was testified to in the days of Jehoash the king. That's what it meant. No place do you ever see people soaking on top of graves or laying on top of graves trying to get an anointing. We had two major figures in the evangelical church supposedly claiming to be saved Christians who were into this kind of practice. 
One was a sexually immoral man, the late Earl Park. Explosive new allegations. Senior I team reporter Dale Russell says the latest allegation is that the bishop molested a child. Dale. Amanda, that's right. Two motions filed in this ongoing case describe the devastating emotional trauma of a woman and her mother discussing allegations of molestation. This time, the allegations come from the bishop's own family. In my stepping across certain lines years ago, nothing recently, 10 years ago, whatever. For the first time since a family friend accused him of sexually abusing her, Bishop Earl Polk Confession publicly confesses. The Lord, but I've not said that to you, and I want you just to forgive me. It I was short and vague, but to the He's couple embroiled in a bitter lawsuit with a bishop and a church they once loved, the confession had a hollow ring. Well, there's no question that he didn't tell the truth. I think it was just to cover up everything else. It was more than a year ago when the I team was first to tell you about Mona and Bobby Brewer. The Brewers were pillars in Bishop Polk's church. They filed a suit asking for unspecified money, saying Polk sexually abused Mona for 14 years, convincing the church singer that she was chosen by God to comfort him sexually. It's a very, very evil situation. Um, it's so much worse than I can even tell you. It's hideous. They weren't alone. Cindy Hall backed up Mona's story in a sworn statement, saying Polk also sexually abused her for years, telling Cindy it was God's will. I thought that was my purpose in life, really, to be honest. That, and that, I know that sounds absolutely ridiculous. And there were other accusers as well. During the early 90s, Bishop People Polk's church I publicist, know. Tricia Weeks, claimed Bishop Polk seduced her. I was sexually involved with Earl Polk. Polk denied his publicist's allegations and refused to comment about Cindy Hall. But later, the granddaughter of another church pastor filed a lawsuit claiming Polk molested her as a child. The suit was settled. Polk denied the allegation. Thank you, Jesus. In fact, until Polk's successor, D.E. Polk, his nephew, turned over the microphone on January 7th, Earl Polk had never admitted to his congregation any wrongdoing. And I am uh, so sorry for any hardship that's come in your life or your family because of, of, of me. Is he talking about this issue with Mona Brewer? Yes, yes he is. Polk never mentioned Mona Brewer by name or said exactly what he did to cross the line. But his lawyer says Polk is admitting to a brief affair years ago with Mona. Why now? What's the timing? Uh, I have no idea. I didn't know he was going to do it, and uh, I suppose the Holy Spirit just moved him to do it. But the I-team has learned of an even more explosive allegation in this case. We found buried in the court files another allegation of sexual abuse aimed at Bishop Polk. This time, the woman says Polk abused her when she was a child. The accuser, Bishop Polk's own granddaughter. The motion filed on behalf of Bishop Polk's granddaughter describes her testimony in the case as given at great emotional and mental expense because the granddaughter claimed that she had been molested by her grandfather, Defendant Polk, when she was a young child. Polk's attorney says and when she gave it's not motion, true. I mean, the, the motion, you can say anything you want to in the motion. Uh, uh, you know, you allege that uh, uh, today's Christmas, but uh, that doesn't mean anything. Uh, what, what's important is the sworn testimony. Another court motion filed at the same time describes the reaction of the granddaughter's mother, Bishop Polk's own daughter. The motion described Polk's daughter as giving testimony that was emotionally devastating after she learned that Polk had molested his granddaughter when she was a young child. Still, Polk's lawyer insists it's not what the mother said under oath. He still contends the bishop is only guilty of a few sexual transgressions involving Mona Brewer a decade ago. The morals are just as, as high in that church as any church in, in the state. But, but you say that, and I'm reading a court paper that says that he well, sexually abused his own granddaughter. Well, this is America, and that you can have your opinion, and I have mine. Uh, I've kissed feet, now I'm kissing your feet. Bobby and Mona Brewer have their own opinion. That the bishop's confession is nothing but a smokescreen, okay. done simply to prepare his congregation for the explosive allegations expected from others claiming to be victims in the Brewer's upcoming trial. No, it was not anything close to the whole truth. So it's not just you? Oh, no, there are many of us. 
Now, the Brewers' lawsuit continues to wind its way through the courts. The trial is expected to begin this spring. One key battle yet to be decided, will other alleged victims, like the bishop's own granddaughter, be allowed to testify during the Brewers' trial? He actually claimed that when his sister Joan died, there was a Christian version of seances. He claimed that he said to the Lord, well, I know seances are of the occult, but there must be a Christian version since the occult always counterfeits the truth. Notice what Paul did. He did not begin with the truth to define error. He began with an error to define truth. This is the sin of necromancy. Another is Benny Hinn, when he would say he would go to Forest Lawn Cemetery near Los Angeles and get the anointing from the graves of Catherine Coleman and so forth and Amy McPherson. Strangest experiences I had a few years ago visiting Amy's tomb in California. This Thursday, I'm on TBN. Friday, I'm going to go and visit Catherine Kuhlman's tomb. It's close by Amy's in Forest Lawn Cemetery. I've been there once already, and every so often I like to go and pay my respects because this great woman of God has touched my life. And the grave uh, where she's buried is closed. They built walls around it. You can't get in without a key. And I'm one of the very few people who can get in. But I'll never forget when I saw Amy's tomb. It's a incredibly dramatic. She was such a lady that her tomb has seven-foot angels bowing on each side of the, the, her tomb with a gold chain around it. As, as incredible as it is that someone would die with angels bowing on each side of her grave, I felt a terrific anointing when I was there. I actually, I, I hear this, I trembled when I visited Amy's tomb. I was shaking all over, God sparked him all over me. The man with me and I were shaking. Norm, who worked with, with Miss Cohen for years, took me there. And Norm and I were trembling under the power of God. I said, dear God, I said, I feel the anointing. I began to weep. This is absolute necromancy. This is not what is happening here. There was no effort to communicate with the dead. There was no effort to derive any spiritual power from communicating with the dead. It was a miracle God did at that time, showing that the message Elisha preached, which foreshadowed the message of the Messiah, was a life-giving message and would restore life from the dead. That's all it meant. No place did Israel or the church ever derive any such practices as fetishism, as relics, or as grave soaking. It's just not in there. That is no basis for anything. You can say all kinds of things. You can try to make anything a basis of a doctrine. There were some crazy people in Britain, or well, they were spiritually crazy, during the Toronto deception. And they took a verse in the book of, of, of uh, Jeremiah, when I behold thy word, I tremble. And they were on the floor vibrating violently, having conniptions, saying that that was the fulfillment of the verse. Anybody can take a verse or passage out of context and make something out of it that the scriptures do not teach. This is not a basis for grave soaking or for necromancy or for any kind of relics or fetishism. It simply is not. Now what's also interesting is the people who were associated with this, living and dead, Earl Polk, sexually immoral, Benny Hinn, caught walking hand in hand while still married to his wife Susan with Paula White on a Via Venuto in Rome. Uh, Amy Simple McPherson, again, serious moral issues. And then Catherine Coleman. Catherine Coleman went, ran off with the husband of another woman. She actually ran off with the husband of another woman as a Christian. All of them had serious, serious moral issues. To look to people like that as some kind of a role model in itself is highly problematic.